Good morning. My name's Jeff Jensen. Hi, I'm not sure whether that's a cheers welcome or a 12-step program welcome, but I'm pleased to be here. So um, when I was in junior high school, a high schooler came to me with a project that he'd been working on in industrial arts. It was a tube radio, and he was having a little trouble working on it, and apparently I had gotten a bit of a reputation for being uh, uh, good with electronics. So uh, I set about trying to finish his project, uh, plugged it in, turned the power on. The fireball that shot out of it was about five feet uh, distance, and I wasn't outside to see it, but as I understand, the lights on the city block dimmed. That was the beginning of me becoming a guy that fixes things, sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully. But uh, what I wanted to do is see if I could convince a few of you folks to take a risk and uh, maybe fix something that you might otherwise throw away. So uh, when I'm talking about fixing, I also consider myself to be a maker from back even before when making was cool. But for me, fixing is taking something that someone else has produced that doesn't do what it used to do and either getting it back working, learning something in failure, getting a box of spare parts, or at least testing my patience and concentration over a long period of time. So uh, one of my bigger projects you see there is a uh, 1961 Ford tractor. What's cool about that is as big as it is, it is one of the simplest mechanical devices you could ever try to fix. I had bought it in Blair, I was driving it home on back roads, and a half a mile away from my uh, house, it died. And uh, a neighbor pulled it onto his property because he couldn't get it all the way to mine. And I spent the next three weeks troubleshooting this in an open field with hand tools that I could take with me in the evening. Uh, it turned out it was a uh, $3 part. For those of you that know uh, ignition systems, the condenser had gone bad. And uh, uh, w once I fixed it, I found out that whoever had fixed it before also put the distributor cap on 180 degrees out, which meant that everything was firing, when I put it back together, exactly wrong. Completely and 100% wrong. So it was a lesson and uh, learned quite a bit. So uh, one of the things that I learned, and I'll start with this, don't ever try to fix something that you depend on. If that might be your cell phone, if that might be the oven, if that might be your car, your only car, don't go after that as a fix-it project. You might want to fix it, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be an educational project, it's not a research project, it's a get the damn thing done project, which is different than what I'm talking about. So, you don't depend on it, you've got some time to spend, because a lot of times you're digging into something you have never seen before, you may not know theory of operation, you may not know how it's assembled, how it should work, but you have an er interest in learning, um, you're willing to accept the possibility that you're going to take something that's broken and make it even more broke. Uh, you're not afraid of it. And I have to tell you that the, one of the next photos I'm going to show you kind of is an indication of uh, fear in, incarnate. Um, you're not doing this for someone else. There's nothing like having to stare at your nephew for the 14th time saying, eh, no, I don't have it done yet. This is supposed to be an uplifting experience, educational experience, self-fulfilling experience. That isn't it. Uh, you're looking for a challenge. It's always fun to build something from scratch, but when you have to get in the head of someone else and they're not there, that's a challenge. And uh, finally, some people really get a kick out of making things work that didn't when they got there. So the first rule, once you have your head straight, is this one. Don't go looking for nuclear physics problems in a radio. The simplest cause is most likely the simplest solution, and it's certainly the easiest one to try. So um, here's some things that you can fix. I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that I'm an electronics geek or anything like that, or a vehicle geek. I don't care. If it's broken, generally I'm interested in making it work. A couple of coffee makers, a Roomba, 
And uh, the interesting thing about the coffee makers, there were no parts involved. These things all have water pumps. And the water pumps that they use don't self-prime. In other words, they don't pull air through till they get the water. The fix was get water into the pump. So I talked about some things that didn't work out so well. Uh, the engine for this thing is in my garage. It's been in my garage, rebuilt and assembled for three or four years. And I just haven't been able to bring myself to finish it. I've got to tear it back apart. There's some extra parts the guy that rebuilt it for me uh, included. It was nice of him to do that because it let me know that there might be things missing inside. So I'm going to have to backtrack and go back after that. What parts are fixable? What problems are fixable? These are some of the things that I've had a little success with. Batteries, connections, things that are just flat out dead. For those of you that have worked with uh, intelligent devices, those are electronic devices that are really just a computer that does something very specific. Uh, a wireless router is a good example of that. Uh, things that are physically broken. If you look at it, there's the part hanging off. Obviously, you've found the cause. Functionally broken. You push the button and nothing happens, but otherwise it looks just fine. Sometimes things have just been abandoned because they're ugly, they're gross, they're dirty, they're out of, uh, out of touch, they're old, whatever it may be. Or it may be something mysterious. How about one of those things that only goes wrong every once in a while? By the way, those are the hardest to figure out. So here are a couple other examples. On the left side, I've got high, uh, high mineral content in my water, hard water. That is the shutoff valve to the kitchen sink. As you can tell, it really wasn't necessary because there wasn't any water going to the kitchen faucet anyway. <laughs> However, uh, vinegar and about 45 minutes works like a champ. Uh, next to that is the uh, stereo, one of the very first electronics projects I dug into that uh, when I got it, it was a mono, not a stereo and uh, took a little while to figure out how I was going to attack that and then how to find the parts. That was about a six-month project, just to put into uh, context what I'm saying about how long you might need to plan to spend before you throw up your hands. So before you attack that project, there's a little bit more head orientation that might help out. Why do you want to fool with this thing? Is it cool? Was it cool? Would you like to have it in your collection? Is there a chance you could learn something from it? How would you like to have this end up? Are you looking for box, stock, factory, shiny, new? Or are you looking for something that just does something? When are you going to quit? How much time, how much money, how much effort are you willing to put into this thing before you throw up your hands? And you need to do that at the beginning because once you get into it, if pride or obstinance gets in the way, you'll forget why you started this thing and now it just becomes something that pisses you off every time you look at it and you're going to fix it, whether that's a smart move or not. Uh, how should it work? And that's an understanding of the system and how it works. Can you tell what's wrong with it? What do you know about it? Where did it come from? When did it stop working? Was there a thunderstorm? Was there water involved? Um, where can you go learn more? The internet is your friend but there's also a slide coming up about other resources for how to figure this thing out. What are you going to need to get into this? Sometimes there are specialized tools, but I've got a bag of parts here that has, have done me well, and they're all stuff from the bathroom, the kitchen, and the office. Um, where do you get spare parts? The internet is again your friend, because almost everything in the world has spare parts available on the internet. You may not recognize them as spare parts, but they're there. So, resources. Number one resource, it's between your ears. All that getting your head straight, getting your understanding of what a win and what a loss is, is in there. But you also have a lot of friends. For those of you who have never heard of the maker group, there's a maker organization here in town filled with people who are like you, if you decide to become a fixer, and who can provide you with tons and tons of insight and guidance, and some of it might even be on the topic that you asked. There's the public library. Um, there are databases and resources online, if you hold an Omaha Public Library card, that allow you to get repair manuals for cars and other devices for free online in the comfort of your own home. You can go researching stuff with fuzzy slippers on. 
Online, you can find manuals from the manufacturer. You can find videos. You can find blogs where people talk about, my thing is broke, and someone else will come back and say, well, here's what you can look into. You can get into forums, which are kind of a longer form version of the same thing. What I will warn you about all of that is, if you go online and say, I've got a digital camera, and the lens is stuck, or whatever your description is, somebody is bound to come back and say, well, don't touch it, you'll ruin the warranty. Dude, it's broken. I can't make it more broken than it is. It doesn't work. So you can either flame back, or you can just carry on and pay attention to the folks that are actually providing you good advice. I'd suggest number two. YouTube is amazing. Generally, everything that is a consumer product has been torn down by some kid in his bedroom three or four times, and he videotaped it. The narration may be interesting. The camera uh, handling may be annoying, but there's a lot of information to be had online. Vendors oftentimes will publish manuals. Sometimes, if you're creative, they might even find, you might even be able to find online the tech or the repair manual, which can help. There are local experts. If you are into repairing stereo equipment, you can find folks that do that too, and you can bounce ideas off. Again, I'd suggest you talk to the folks at the Maker Group. There are other exports, experts online. Um, you might find those folks running a website. There's a place called, um, oh, I can't remember the fellow's name, something digital, Digicams. And all he talks about is digital cameras, reviews, repair information, parts sources, all sorts of things. And I'll go back to your brain, but taking it, uh, the problem on in a different way, meditation. If you understand how something is supposed to work, you recognize how it is not working. Now you can sit down in a uh, quiet place, maybe without that even there with you, and think about what could cause that problem. I understand all the components, I understand what com uh, they contribute to it. How could I either test it and confirm where the problem is, or think of creative ways to get help? So first step, replace the batteries. I gotta tell you that 20 to 30% of everything that's broken has crappy batteries in it. When you're replacing those batteries, make sure you pay attention to which end's plus and which end's minus. I can't tell you how many times I've done one of those stupid wall clocks, didn't have my glasses on, didn't see the little plus symbol in the uh, battery holder, put it in and thought, ah, crap, it really is broken this time. No, I didn't pay attention. Take lots of pictures. If you sleep after you tear something apart, pardon me, let me phrase that differently. If I sleep after I've taken something apart, I forget how it came apart. Take pictures, it shows you where things were, it shows you how they were oriented. It shows you where the cables ran. Um, all sorts of really great information that if you don't do it while you're tearing it down, hmm, it may be more difficult. Figure out as well as you can what's not working. If you can get it down to the actual piece that's broken, that's great. But if you can at least identify in that whole system what's not working, that helps a lot too. Go online. Look it up. Read everything you can find on that, and then go back to the previous step and apply what you've just learned to figure out what you're gonna do. Okay, now you get out the tools. Tear it apart. And uh, I'll tell you that there are tons of variations of how things go together. Screws, plastic tabs, hot melt glue, uh, just all sorts of different ways that people have to put things together. The, uh, the most difficult of all of those, in my mind, are the plastic tabs. When you're trying to take a plastic tab and bend it just enough to get it to the release, but not so much as to break the damn thing off, that can be a challenge. So uh, there are opportunities to ruin this thing all throughout the project, but those plastic tabs are probably the best, and maybe not so much because a lot of times you can get by with half of them broken. Same thing for screws. As long as you're not going to handle this thing in a really rough environment, you can put a laptop together with a couple of screws missing, as long as you're careful about which ones, you know, you may have to move this one to a critical location, you can get away with it. Put it back together. Sometimes, just the simple act of taking something apart and reassembling it 
will cause whatever problem to go away. I think a lot of times that turns out to be corrosion on contacts and the simple disconnecting and reconnecting cleans them and it works. It could be that something was f stuck. It ne may need to be cleaned, it may need lubrication. Tearing it apart, you see something dirty, you'll probably clean it up anyway. When you put it back together, it works and then you try it out. Um, I never thought that I could tear apart a digital camera until I did. I never thought it would work when I was done, but it did. Um, when you get into digital cameras, or a lot of these things, if you're doing this as an educational activity and you're buying something just to get your hands dirty, I'd suggest you stick with a manufacturer because within that manufacturer's engineering department, they're going to approach the same requirement oftentimes in the same way. If you learn this model, you got a fairly good idea of how that model works. Also, uh, they sometimes use the same parts over and over again. So even if you can't fix this one, it may become an organ donor for that one. And they, you don't have to go chasing after parts all over the place. The hardest part with these things is my eyesight. Uh, I have to wear a magnifying glass. So this is not something I do out in public, um, mostly because I'm too damn vain to do something like that. But uh, you'll end up wearing these throughout the entire process. You'll have to take breaks and walk away from it. But this is essential when you're dealing with really, really tiny parts. So, what can you use to get the things that are broken and to get parts to repair them if you determine it's a part problem? You may already have it. If you've got the two cameras, pick the one that looks like it's going to be the easiest to fix, especially if the other one has a different problem, and go to town. See if you can learn whatever you can and have some fun. Craigslist. I put an, a post up on Craigslist asking for broken tablets. 10 to 15 dollars a piece, whatever condition. Uh, I got about three or four, had a great time either learning or fixing them, with the exception of the one that had been on the guy's hood of his car until he put on the brakes. It slid off, he drove over it. Uh, it's spare parts, but not very many spare parts. Uh, garage sales, Goodwill, uh, eBay, Amazon are good places for both parts and for the uh, the uh, patient, if you will. Uh, also, Alibaba and AliExpress, kind of the Asian equivalent of eBay, offer a lot of times spare parts that you can't find anywhere else. Salvage and organ donors we've talked about. There are specialty online stores, so if you're looking to do repair on stereo equipment, speakers, things of that sort, there are companies that cater to that. They know exactly what you need, and they can be a lot of help, too, in finding what you need. Sometimes there are local specialty stores. Radio Shack used to be kind of a specialty store. Now they're a great place to buy a cell phone. Um, Habitat Restore. If you're looking for something really odd, maybe a little bit old, you're, you can find some amazing things in the aisles of Habitat Restore. And uh, then repurposed parts. So you get to the end of the project, the patient did not survive. Instead of just trashing the whole thing, look at what it is you might be able to take away. Those little teeny tiny screws, try to find those anywhere else. They are hard to come by. Strip that stuff out. Strip other things that you think are going to be of value out of that. Put them in your parts box. Something like this will hold a lot of little teeny tiny parts. And now you've got uh, at least what you'll need for the next time you dig into something. So this is a uh, sample, uh, so I'm trying to break this up a little bit and intersperse some different things in it. This is a sample of a battery. Uh, this is made by Logitech. It's a fairly expensive, uh, in its time, programmable remote control with a nice display so you can see what it's going to do and what device it's going to talk to. There's a battery in there. The original battery that came out of this product, or came with this product, had a problem of swelling when it got bad and it would swell so much that you couldn't get it out with a chisel. So picked this up for $5 at a garage sale, figured out where the little plastic tabs were, what had to be peeled off, what had to be peeled back, got the battery out, found the new style battery on eBay for about five or six bucks. For $10, I had a really nice remote. So uh, talking about tools, your first tool is your brain. The better you can apply your logic, your reason, your creativity, your experience, your knowledge of materials, 
uh, electricity, physics, whatever, the better you can come out of this whole thing. Your phone camera. It's uh, nowadays probably the best camera you've ever owned in your life, and the incremental cost of that next photo is exactly zero cents. It costs you nothing to take more pictures. Take lots of them. Stuff around the house. I told you that I had the bag full of things that uh, were really easy to find. That's it. Skewers, toothpicks, tape of all sorts, erasers, towels, Q-tips. Those things are great for cleaning, pushing things around, peeling things back, moving those little plastic tabs that uh, you have to deal with. Um, hand tools. Harbor Freight, for whatever else you might think of them, has some really inexpensive and serviceable hand tools, whether you're talking about the tiny little uh, uh, pliers, the screwdriver sets that uh, come with 37 different bits, all of them smaller than uh, what you can find at uh, a regular hardware store, um, tweezers, just all sorts of different things that are really great and reasonably priced. Uh, speaking of that, if you uh, pay attention to the Sunday ads in the paper, they always have an insert and sometimes that insert offers a free meter with a purchase. So this was a bonus day. There are all sorts of free items you could get, including that meter. I'm not sure whether the cheap screwdriver set was on here, but it's all sorts of things. This one's expired, otherwise I'd give it away to you. But uh, check the Sunday paper. Soldering tools. If you're going to get into electronics, or electrical stuff, you probably ought to consider getting a good soldering set. Uh, what is a good soldering set? Something that has uh, adjustable temperature. Sometimes you can get the hot, uh, temperature too low and you'll never get things to melt. Sometimes it'll get so hot that it'll melt everything around it. So having that fine control is a fairly important step. A fine tip is important if you're doing circuit boards. A broader tip is important if you're doing something that's a little bit uh, less delicately assembled. Um, glue. Hot melt glue guns are great to put things back together, especially if that tab broke off and you're not sure how you're going to keep it from popping open. Super glue is useful. Epoxy, Gorilla Glue, uh, those are all great. Hacked up and made up uh, gear. Uh, there are things you can do with a light bulb, a light socket, and an electrical appliance that will keep, from destroying its, keep it from destroying itself if it has a real problem and uh, allow you to do some work on it that you couldn't otherwise. If you're into tearing apart little tiny things, cameras, uh, MP3 players, cell phones, paper plate with some tape, sticky tape on it, that allows you to take the parts out of the device, kind of put them in order that they came out, and they aren't going to get knocked around when you happen to hit this. Uh, I haven't done that religiously, and somewhere in my kitchen there are at least three tiny screws that I cannot find. Uh, good lighting. Along with having something to be able to see what you're doing, lighting is really important. Eyewear, magnifying glasses, and then some nice uh, cleaning chemicals. Alcohol is helpful, simple green. Uh, brake cleaner. Uh, brake cleaner will dissolve just about everything because it's a mix of about four different solvents. It's also flammable and probably not particularly healthy to breathe, so uh, keep that in mind. And water is useful. Here's the one that my nephew keeps asking about. So be safe. You're dealing with sharp things, electricity, moving parts, um, and unhealthy chemicals. Plan ahead. Uh, take your precautions. And uh, that's pretty much it. How about questions? Anybody have questions?